Coming up, leading the way, we'll introduce you to some brave kids who may just be key in ending the pandemic. Also ahead, out of this world, new pictures from Mars help shed some light on the red planet. What you need to know about Mars and whether there's life up there. Plus, around the globe, come along as we head to Iceland and show you just how cool this place is. Then we'll get an up-close look at dolphins and introduce you to Harmony at the Shedd Aquarium. And inspiring kids, you'll meet this 13-year-old boy who has turned his love for crochet into a way to help kids in need. You can give back with crochet, and they can also raise money to donate to projects that are very near and dear to my heart. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome to Nightly News Kids Edition. I hope you're having a great day. I'm Lester Holt, coming to you from my New York City apartment. We've got a really awesome lineup ahead. We'll take you to Iceland and then go all the way to outer space. We're covering a lot of territory today. Then we'll put you to the test in honor of Women's History Month. Plus, they're back. I'll have to introduce you to my enforcer. Legendary frenemies unite for a new mission with an important message. Our pal Jackson Daly so, speaks with actress Chloe Grace Moretz. But first, let's get to our top story this week, and that's the pandemic. As you guys know, it's been nearly a year since the pandemic hit, and finally we're seeing some good news. Cases continue to decline, and there are now three vaccines available in the United States for adults, and thanks to some brave kids, soon there could be a vaccine for some children. Our friend Kristen Dahlgren explains. It's a question a lot of you are asking. When will kids get their vaccines? When will me and my sister get ours? We love Kids Edition. Bye! And we love your questions. So today, we want you to meet Caleb Chung. Like many of you, he's a typical kid but he may just be key in ending the pandemic. I'm really excited for that. He's one of more than 2,000 kids aged 12 to 15 taking part in Pfizer's clinical trial for the COVID-19 vaccine. That's how companies test to make sure the vaccine is safe for kids. In a trial, some kids are given the vaccine and others a shot without any vaccine called a placebo. But none of the kids taking part know which one they're getting. It wasn't that bad. It was just like a normal um, flu shot. Doctors then test the kids to see if they're protected from COVID. It's really important to see, you know, in this particular age range, how does the vaccine affect the kids? How is the immunity from the vaccines? Are there any serious side effects? that we need to monitor and watch for. So it's very important anytime we do any vaccinations that the clinical trials have to be done. Sam and his sister Audrey are also in the trial. You might go through all this and like not even get the vaccine, but in the end, it's really helping science. Since children are usually smaller than adults, the trials help doctors know how much vaccine to give them. If children are protected from COVID without serious side effects, the vaccine should be approved for children. Once trials are done for 12 and up, younger kids will be tested. For kids 12 to 17, it looks like they can get their shots starting this summer. For younger kids, it looks like the fall or maybe even early 2022. People under 18 make up almost a quarter of the population, so you are all important to ending the pandemic. It's really devastating seeing what's been happening, and if me participating in this trial can do anything to bring that end closer, nearer, then I'd like to do it. The kids in vaccine trials now being called heroes for signing up. It's a way that we can impact people when usually we can't as kids. And this could have a big impact in ending the pandemic. I thought that it would be like something cool to say, uh, to tell like my grandkids and my kids that, oh, I was part of creating this COVID vaccine, um, like, I don't know, 50 years from now when this is all in the distant past. <laughs> Won't that day be nice, thanks to some really brave children. All right, Kristen, thanks. Well, we know you guys have more questions, so let's get straight to them right now. Joining us now in our Ask the Doc segment is our pal, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, our first question is from Pennsylvania. Hi, my name is Ezra, and I live in Philadelphia, 
And my question is, what happens if the coronavirus gets on our mask? Will we get the coronavirus? Thank you. And be familiar with kids' edition is awesome. Ezra, thanks. That's a great question. And Dr. John, I was thinking about that just the other day. I passed somebody on the sidewalk and they coughed and I was worried about what's happening on my mask. You know, and the way the masks are made, you want a mask is two or three layers. And the reason you want it is because it's an obstacle course for the virus to get through. So the virus is going to try and get through there. It's going to get stuck on that first layer or maybe even that second layer that's there, but it's not going to get inside your mouth or your nose. But you have to realize that the virus can get inside your mask. So when you get back home, if you've been out and about, especially around a lot of people, you want to go ahead and take this mask, wash it, make sure it let it dry out and put a different mask on. But if you haven't been really around that many people, you can wear the same mask all day long. Shouldn't be a big issue. All right, Dr. John, thanks for that. Our next question is about playing with your friends. Our question is, is it safe for our friends to play with us outside if we wear masks? Paula and Mahita, great question. Dr. John, what about it? You know, and I can understand their friends saying, you're going to school. I don't want to get coronavirus if you get it at school. But the chances of getting it at school are very low, especially if you wear a mask and stay away from other people like they want you to. But even so, main thing you want to do is when you're playing with other kids, whether you're in school or not in school, whether you're virtual or physically at school, you want to make sure you wear a mask and you social distance. So think of games you can do like that. Have jump rope contests, have juggling contests. You can even throw a Frisbee. If you have a friend out there you want to do it with, make sure you throw a football so they can catch it, and you can just throw it back and forth. Lester, catch. <laughs> <laughs> How about that, huh? <laughs> nice there throw. you go. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> just like that. It's amazing what we can get to these satellites these days. Dr. John Torres, thanks as always. <laughs> you bet. All right. Also making news recently, NASA has been sharing some pretty amazing pictures from the planet Mars. And it got us thinking, just what exactly is the red planet all about? Our friend Dylan Dreyer takes a look at Mars, and there's a few things that may surprise you. One, seven months after it launched from Earth. And liftoff. This was the reaction in NASA's mission control as the Mars rover Perseverance touched down on the red planet. <laughs> Perseverance is about 10 feet long and gets around on six wheels. NASA controls it from here on Earth as it travels around Mars conducting important science experiments. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. It's about half the size of Earth and has about a third of the Earth's gravity. That means if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you'd only weigh about 38 on Mars. Right now, it's a dusty, cold desert world. But scientists think it once was warm and covered in water. What did it look like back then? That's a great question, because when you see Mars today, it looks dry and dusty and red. You see all the red dirt everywhere, all the red dust. But in the past, we actually know that it was warmer and wetter. It probably had lakes and rivers. And that's why they send Perseverance there, to search for signs of ancient life. Billions of years ago, when it was warm and wet, there were probably little tiny microscopic organisms that started to form. So we might be able to find those little fossils and see them. If scientists do find life on Mars, it might mean there's life on tons of planets all throughout the universe. And if they don't, it could mean the abundance of life here on Earth is very unique. Either way, the answer is sure to tell us a lot about our own place in the cosmos. Mars has two moons called Phobos and Deimos. It also has the largest volcano in our solar system called Olympus Mons. It's more than twice the height of Mount Everest and you could fit all of the islands of Hawaii inside its crater. The average temperature on Mars is a freezing negative 81 degrees. And get this, the average Mars year is about twice an Earth year because it takes longer to orbit around the sun. Let's say someone was turning five. How old would they be in Mars years? So if someone were five years old on Earth, they would actually be just a little over two and a half years old on Mars. NASA is working on plans to send humans there as soon as the next decade, the 2030s. In the meantime, the Mars rover is helping scientists get closer to answering one of the biggest questions in our universe. Is there life on Mars? 
All right, Dylan, thanks very much for that great information. And for space nerds like me, that was very cool. Hey, we want to turn now to a new series we're launching on this show called Around the Globe. The idea is we take you to different countries, we introduce you to cultures and kids from all over the world. Our friend Kerry Sanders starts us off with our first profile, Iceland. And this one is pretty cool. Iceland is stunningly beautiful. It lies far north in the Atlantic Ocean, near the frigid Arctic Circle, home to glaciers and active volcanoes. This country, about the size of Kentucky, has a population of only 355,000, including some students we met over Zoom. My name is Kerry, and I'm in Fort Lauderdale. What's your name? You hit the same one. Translate that for me. What does that mean? My name is Simone. I go to Lantakut School and I practice ballet and I'm very friendly. The Icelandic alphabet looks like the one you know, but with 10 extra letters. Kids there also learn English in school, which makes it easier for students at American Heritage Schools in Florida to ask a few questions. Hi, my name is Ashley Knapp, and I go to American Heritage. For fun, I like to read. What do you like to do? Basically the same thing, but I like to go to the pool and swim a few laps. My name is Shiv. I love science and reading about machines. What do you like to read about? I like to read about um, deep stories and that are real. One of our favorite snacks here in the United States, potato chips. But in Iceland, their favorite is this. And that's called harfiskur in Icelandic. And if it's translated on English, it's called hard fish. But it's not actually very hard. It's just dried up fish that you eat out of a packet. Here's a trivia question about Iceland. Are we on a continent? Are we on an island? What are we on? Right now, you're actually, uh, you're actually standing in Europe. If you move maybe 40 kilometers uh, this direction, you'll be standing in the North America. List. We asked our NBC News friend visiting Iceland to take us to the actual dividing line. I'm Sarah Harmon in Iceland. I'm here at the bridge between the continents. Over here is the North American plate. This is the Eurasian plate. Each year, these two plates drift a little further apart, about an inch each year. Iceland is filled with natural pools. The most famous, the Blue Lagoon. The geothermal warm waters bubble to the surface, making even a cold day a perfect day for a swim. Because of where Iceland is located on Earth, some days in winter have only three hours of sunlight. But in the summer, the sun is up almost the entire day. Is it difficult to sleep at night in the summertime because the sun doesn't really go down? Well, usually we have like curtains like right there for the, um, for the windows, so we don't usually see the sun, like the brightness outside. So it's not too hard. And in summertime, Iceland looks like this, green. All right, Carrie, thanks very much. Of all the places I visited, I have to say Iceland is probably in the top five. Well, time now for our pop quiz, where we have a little fun and put you to the test. March is Women's History Month, and the subject today is the Supreme Court. The question is, who was the first female Supreme Court justice? Was it A, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, B, Sonia Sotomayor, or C, Sandra Day O'Connor? We'll have the answer after the break. Coming up, we'll meet this baby dolphin who's helping teach kids in Chicago and inspiring kids. This teenage boy is the king of crafting and has turned his passion into a way to help others. All right, welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. Let's get the answer to our pop quiz. The question was, who was the first female Supreme Court justice? Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, or Sandra Day O'Connor? The answer? C, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman on the Supreme Court. She served from 1981 to 2006. She was appointed by President Ronald Reagan. 
Well, March marks the start of Dolphin Awareness Month. Did you know there was such a thing? And at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, they're partnering with classrooms across the city to learn about these really intelligent creatures. Our pal Kevin Tibbles got up close and personal. It's playtime at Chicago's Shedd Aquarium. And while the older dolphins tear it up, there's a new kid on the block making a splash. Her name is Harmony. And helping me to get nowhere is the shed senior director of animal behavior and training, Steve Abel. She's about six months of age right now and has been not only uh, brought joy to us as a staff and uh, as the shed aquarium, but she's brought a whole ton of joy to the city of Chicago. Harmony weighs about 100 pounds and belongs to the Pacific white sided dolphin family, which, as you can see, is a rambunctious bunch. She's already eating solid food, which in this case is fish, right out of my hand. But as a baby, she remains a constant companion of her mom, whose name is Cottrell. What's also special is how Harmony got her name from kids. I think the students were very excited to be able to have a unique opportunity um, in a really tough year. We were really excited to partner with all fourth grade students in the city of Chicago um, and um, give them that moment, that spark of curiosity. Yes, grade four students in Chicago all got to vote on what the shed was going to name its newborn and Harmony was what they picked. These kids think it's great. Harmony is like you stay in perfect harmony which means together. Harmony is usually singing or Harmony is stay together. It's a good name. Harmony, my, my Harmony kind of has a good way into it. Now, did you know that March is Dolphin Awareness Month? So what a great idea to study up on these beautiful marine mammals that aren't fish. They have to surface to breathe air just like we do. And there are 42 different types. They have all sorts of different needs. They have physical needs, social needs, training needs, mental needs. And the trainers, all the animal care staff professionals that you see here are experts at meeting all of those needs. Your local aquarium is a great place to learn about life underwater. There might be some penguins or even a curious beluga whale sneaking over to give a kiss. And some dolphins, of course, like Harmony and her extended family, who will stand up on their tails and flip to see you. All right, thanks, Kevin. Let's switch gears now and turn to two legendary rivals are back and have united for an important mission. The story unfolds in the new movie, Tom and Jerry. Here now is our pal Jackson Daly, who recently caught up with actress Chloe Grace Moretz to talk about the movie, the message, and what it's like working with a pair of legends. Hey, Chloe. Um, I watched Tom and Jerry. The movie's amazing. Thank you very much. I'm happy you enjoyed it. So. Can you tell me a little about your character, Kayla, in the movie? Yeah, for sure. Kayla is basically a young woman who just loses her job, and she's on the hunt for a new job. And she tells a pretty big white lie and gets herself into a pretty high-end position at a hotel. And then when she's tested with her very first task of ridding the hotel of a mouse problem, she thinks hiring Tom to get rid of Jerry would be a good idea. I'll have to introduce you to my enforcer. <laughs> what was it like, because Tom and Jerry are animated, what was it like acting in front of nothing? <laughs> yeah, nothing. Uh, it, was, it was probably what you can imagine. Um, it was pretty silly. Half the time I was having to uh, act opposite either a tennis ball or a blue X with a little name tag that said Tom. And then, you know, what we started to realize is the more that I would improv, the better it was for the animators because they are silent characters. So the more that I would make up that they were doing, the animators could go even further in post-production. What do you think's like the big message of the movie that you want like kids to learn about? I mean, I think something that I really enjoyed in this movie was the idea of unity. I'm gonna plan an entire day for you two to spend together. You know, I think that I grew up with a bunch of siblings um, and I don't know if you have any siblings, but you, you know, you might pull their hair, you might trip each other up, you might punch each other, but at the end of the day, you eat dinner together 
and uh, you're a family. And you know, I think what's important about this story, and especially right now um, in our country and across the world, unity is is something we need to focus on and coming together uh, across different boundaries and being able to uh, know that we might tear each other's hair out, but we're all in this together. Thanks for talking to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Jackson. Finally, in our inspiring kids series, a teen has been using his hands and heart to craft a special way of giving back to others. Hello, crochet friends. It's me, Jonah. Jonah Larson is the king of crafting. You also need a six millimeter crochet hook. The 13 year old learned to crochet at the age of five. I sat down at our kitchen table and in about an hour, I made a blue and green striped dishcloth. And I still have and use that dishcloth today. I make everything when it comes to crochet. You think of it, I've probably crocheted it. Hats, scarves, mittens, fingerless gloves, cowls, stuffed animals, wall hangings. He turned his passion into a means of helping others. I found that you can give back with crochet and they can also raise money to donate to projects that are very near and dear to my heart. And it was also just a way to connect with others and bring the world together, closer together, one stitch at a time. This is a great basket for beginners. That's exactly what Jonah has been doing for years through his organization, Jonah's Hands. The reason why I always make sure I give back is because that's what my parents have always taught me. Adopted from Ethiopia as a young boy, Jonah has been devoted to helping kids in the community where he was born by selling his crocheted items and leading a successful GoFundMe campaign. Jonah just helped create a library and science lab for kids in Ethiopia, which he hopes to visit one day. Thank you, Joa. We love you. I'll be able to see a library and a science lab with my name on it and know that I helped to give those kids a chance to read and dream and be successful. But it'll also be very big for me because it'll be my first time going back to Ethiopia. While Jonah is achieving big, his advice is to always start small. It doesn't have to be crochet. It can be anything else and any hobby that makes you happy and brings you joy. And joining us now is Jonah Larson. Jonah, thanks so much for joining us. Before I, I talked to you, I was watching you on the monitor, and you do that so effortlessly. What are you feeling? What are you thinking when you're crocheting? When I'm crocheting, when I, I don't even have to think about it. It's because I've done it for eight years. My hands just know what to do, and they go off on their own, and it just is so calming and therapeutic as the yarn glides over the hook and makes that slight whirring sound that it just totally pulls you in into a different world. Oh man, that's terrific. I know you haven't had a chance to visit, but you've seen the pictures of the library and lab that were created with your help. What, what does it make you feel like to see it up in operation? This seems like the obvious thing to say, but it makes you feel proud. But what it really makes you feel is the need to do it again. Because after you help someone, and in my case, you know that you help give kids an education and a library and a science lab, the feeling that you get is greater than what you're giving, and it makes you want to do it all over again. So I think it's a really nice cycle of the thought process behind giving back to others. Yeah, that's such important advice. But it's like I said, it's a lot of fun to watch you do that so effortlessly, and, uh, and I think you're going to inspire a lot of kids. Jonah, thanks so very much, and, and keep up the great work, okay? Yes, thank you very much for having me on. Crochet away, friends. Well, that's going to do it for us. Before we go, parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming show. And just a programming note, you can catch a new episode of Nightly News Kids Edition every Thursday on nbcnews.com and YouTube. Thanks for watching, everyone, and remember, take care of yourself and each other.